Hello, I'm Nathaniel Virgo. In this lecture, we're going to talk about reaction networks and autocatalysis. Autocatalysis means chemical self-production. One way to define it would be that it's the ability of a set of chemical species to make more of that same set by undergoing a series of chemical reactions. Why is it important? We've all seen the videos in which a bacterial cell reproduces exponentially to produce a great many more bacterial cells. The ability to make more of itself at the level of the chemical substrate is a key feature of all living systems, even those that don't reproduce. And so the question naturally arises, under what circumstances can this kind of chemical self-production occur in a purely abiological system? Answering this is important for several reasons in studies of the origin of life. It helps us to answer questions both about the origin of metabolism, how did the molecules of life first get created uh, before there was life to, to make them, um, and it also helps us to answer questions about the origin of evolution, how did cells acquire the ability to produce not just more cells in general, but more of their own particular species with its own particular genetic makeup. The place to start is by thinking about chemical reactions. Imagine that we have a chemical species A in solution. These molecules are all moving around at random, and occasionally they collide. When they do collide, occasionally, they react to form another species B. This of course happens repeatedly, and so if we were to watch this system over time, we would see that the concentration of A decreases while the concentration of B increases. This reaction would be written 2A goes to B, where A are called the reactants and B is the product. As a general rule, reactions happen faster the higher the concentration of reactants on the left-hand side of the arrow. In this case, the reaction would happen at a rate roughly proportional to the square of the concentration of A, because two A molecules have to meet in order, to, in order for the reaction to proceed. Uh, this simple fact that reactions happen faster when there are more reactants uh, is crucial in understanding how reaction networks give rise to dynamics. One type of reaction that we're particularly interested in is catalysis, which of course is crucial in biology, it's what enzymes do, and also in most theories of the origin of life. If this reaction required a catalyst, we would write it as 2A goes to B with a C over the top of the arrow, where C is the catalyst species. Or we might think of C as being both a product and a reactant of this reaction. And it's worth going through a simple model of catalysis in a little detail, uh, just because it gives us our first very simple example of a reaction network. So I've taken the same reaction, 2A plus catalyst goes to B plus catalyst, and I've split it into three reaction steps. It would be possible to split it still further. So in the first step, the two A molecules, which are called the substrate, uh, binds to the catalyst. This binding would normally be through electrostatic forces, but we can think of the complex thus formed as, a, as being like a molecule. The second step is that the reaction itself occurs, and the third step is that the product unbinds from the catalyst particle, leaving it free to participate in further reactions. This set of reaction steps uh, forms a reaction network. A reaction network is simply a set of uh, chemical reactions where the, the products of some uh, form the reactants of others. And there are many ways to draw them graphically as networks, but one of the simplest is this one, where the reactions are drawn as arrows that can either split or merge, depending on how many reaction, uh, how many reactants and products there are. So each of these blue arrows corresponds to one of the reaction steps on the left, uh, and you can see that overall it takes in two A particles and outputs one B particle, as we would expect. Uh, but one thing to notice is that this network contains a cycle. This is because the catalyst particle gets returned after the sequence of reactions. So the presence of cycles in reaction networks is a common feature that's associated with catalysis. So this is called a catalytic cycle. And in fact, one very broad definition of a catalyst might be that a catalyst is something that gets returned after a sequence of reactions. Um, this definition allows catalysts to be if, uh, something much more complicated than an enzyme, but it still has the overall property that you would expect it at least that you would expect it to speed up the, the, the overall reaction without getting consumed. Um, an autocatalyst then is uh, something or what we call a network autocatalyst is something that acts as a catalyst in this particular sense. 
uh, but it catalyzes its own production. Uh, and we'll see an, a, a simple example of that now. So our first example is called the Formos reaction. The name is a contraction of formaldehyde and aldose, and it's quite an old reaction having been discovered in the 1860s. Um, it's potentially important in the origin of life because it's a prebiotically plausible way in which you can create sugars uh, starting from formaldehyde. But for our purposes here, the key feature is just that it's autocatalytic. So here's a very simplified sketch of, of what happens at the core of the foremost reaction. We start with formaldehyde, which is a, a one carbon molecule. And if you have formaldehyde in relatively high concentration under the right conditions, there's a very slow reaction that will take two formaldehyde molecules and join them together to form glycoaldehyde, which is a two carbon sugar. From now on, we're just going to represent things like this, uh, because our main interest is not in the chemical details of, of the reactions, but in the topology of the network. And we can get that from this simplified representation in terms of the carbon atoms. So we have many single carbon formaldehyde molecules, and because it was produced by only a slow reaction, just a few glycoaldehyde molecules. The interesting thing is that once you've got the two carbon sugar, there are other reactions that will happen much more quickly that can convert it into a three and then a four carbon sugar. Things can get more complicated from here because the sugar can continue to extend and it can begin to branch, becoming a more complex sugar. But uh, for our purposes, the and there are also uh, tautomerization reactions that are important for what follows that I'm not showing. But for our purposes, uh, the important thing is that one of the possible next steps after this state uh, is that another different reaction will split the four carbon sugar back into two glycoaldehyde molecules. So we started with a single glycoaldehyde and we ended up with two. And of course, the cycle can repeat, converting both of the glycoaldehydes into four carbon sugars and then into four glycoaldehydes and eight and 16 and so on. Of course, it doesn't happen in strict sequence like this, but instead, all of the reactions happen simultaneously. And the result is that all of the sugars increase exponentially in concentration. If we draw this graphically, it looks like this. And you can see that it looks broadly similar to the um, catalytic cycle that we saw earlier, uh, but the difference is that it has what's called a branching step. Uh, a branching step is where one of the intermediates, one of the, the species on the cycle, uh, reacts to produce not one but two other intermediates. In this case, it was two glycoaldehyde molecules, but it could have been two different intermediates uh, instead. Uh, and a, a, a catalytic cycle with a branching step is called an autocatalytic cycle which is the simplest kind of autocatalytic network. There are other more complicated kinds. But the key feature is that once we've gone through all the reactions in the network, we end up with more of the intermediates than we started with. That's what makes it autocatalytic. And so if you were to run this reaction, as many people have, uh, you would find that initially it doesn't seem to do very much because the glycoaldehyde is being produced only by very slow reactions. But once it's there, uh, and so there's this onset delay, a lag time in which nothing much seems to happen. But once the glycoaldehyde is there, the concentration of sugars grows exponentially uh, until fairly quickly it begins to saturate because all of the formaldehyde has been depleted or some other limiting factor has come into play. This kind of S-shaped curve of exponential growth followed by saturation is very common in biology. You will see it, for example, when a new species enters a new niche. Autocatalysis is a very active area of experimental research in several different contexts. Uh, one of these is, is understanding the origin of, of biological metabolites or other molecules that may have originally played similar roles. Um, one example that people look at is the reverse citric acid cycle, which is a fairly fundamental part of the metabolism of most autotrophs. Uh, and um, the, this is actually an autocatalytic cycle. It, it has a branching step, which is highlighted here. Uh, but unlike the foremost reaction, these, these reactions are performed inside the cell by sophisticated protein enzymes. And so it's an active area of research whether there are minerals that can catalyze reactions that are analogous to these and could play the same sort of role. At the other end of the scale, there are groups working on autocatalysis involving macromolecular interactions and molecular self-assembly. These are screenshots from a video by Zeep and Otto's group. Uh, they start with um, they start with molecular building blocks that can self-assemble into these ring structures. Depending on their size, these rings can stack on top of each other, and the stacks can grow quite long. But when the system is stirred, the stacks can break in half. And so through a mechanism roughly similar to the one I showed for the foremost reaction, the concentration of stacks can grow exponentially. 
So I want to end the video by talking about the relationship between autocatalysis and biological replication. Uh, it, uh, at first sight, these are similar processes. You start with uh, you start with one organism, if it's an asexual reproducer, and you end up with two, and then four, and eight, and so on, until it saturates. Uh, and in fact, they are similar. You could see this as an example of autocatalysis. But biological replication has an additional feature that is lacked by the simplest chemical um, autocatalytic systems, and that's that there is a diversity in biology, and that diversity is inherited. Offspring tend to be similar to their parents, perhaps with the occasional mutation. So although the FORMO cycle, for example, uh, does actually produce a wide variety of different sugars and have many branching side reactions that produce other sugars than the ones shown, um, that that diversity is not inherited by the next generation to any significant degree, as far as we know. So people have thought about chemical mechanisms through which heredity could occur, um, and one of those would be template replication, which is very, which is similar in a way to, the, to, to how, by, how DNA replicates inside a cell, the difference being that, uh, in theory, it doesn't require enzymes. So the idea here is that you start with a, uh, a polymer such as RNA or something similar that is made of different types of monomer, and these are able to undergo complementary base pairing. So you can start with a string and produce the complementary string. Repeating the process would replicate the original string. This has been shown experimentally, on the left is a famous example by Gunter von Kudrowski, uh, in which he constructed monomers. Uh, his monomers are constructed from modified RNA trimers. Uh, and on the right is, an, is a demonstration that some colleagues and I made, where the monomers are made of plastic and magnets and are being blown around by CPU fans on a giant air hockey table. Both of these examples do work. You can start with uh, you can start with one string and form its complementary string and then go through another cycle and end up with, co with multiple copies of the original string. The problem is that the monomers themselves have to be quite complicated. This is not because it's difficult to form the templated string, but rather it's because it's difficult to prevent the monomers from just spontaneously forming into random strings. And if that happens, then all of the signal gets lost and the fact that the heredity occurred ends up not really mattering. <coughs> So this brings us to what's called Eigen's paradox, which is one of the, the biggest challenges that faces any theory of the origin of life. If you look at the way that DNA is replicated inside a cell, you see that it isn't a spontaneous process. It requires energy in the form of ATP uh, and is coordinated by quite a sophisticated series of molecular protein machines. In order to get these complicated machines, you need uh, evolution by natural selection, and in order to have evolution, you need to have high fidelity replication, but you need the complicated molecular machines in order to have the high fidelity replication in the first place. Eigen estimated that a sequence of around 100 uh, nucleotides would be needed uh, in order to code for enzymes that would be capable of replicating nucleic acids. Um, and so Eigen's paradox is that you seem to have to start already in quite a complicated place to in order to have high fidelity replication in order to have evolution. And so in order to get around this paradox, we have to think of simpler ways in which heredity can be, could be implemented that, that are not as complex as the way it's done inside of the cell. So there are several possibilities for how her, uh, heredity could operate in a prebiotic system. Template replication is one of them, as I, I showed earlier the demonstration. Um, uh, another idea is that you could have a, an RNA enzyme that is uh, similar to a replicate in that it's able to copy RNA. Uh, it may not be able to copy any string at all, but it would be good enough to copy its own string. This doesn't completely get around Eigen's paradox either, uh, because you still have to start with something complicated enough to, form, to perform as an enzyme, but it may be initially much simpler than the, than the, um, than the enzymes required to replicate any possible RNA strand, and so this is a potentially promising area of active research. Another possibility is called compositional heredity. The idea here is that you don't start with polymer sequences at all, but instead you start with protocells of some kind, which are assemblies of many different molecular species, and the heritable information is transferred not in the, not in the form of a sequence, but in the form of the composition of the protocell, which would be inherited when it divides in two. And there are theoretical studies showing that this could in fact be possible to, um, to, to support evolution this way. So, uh, so 
Eigen's paradox is that it's not completely solved. And in fact, um, in fact, all of the questions in this, all of the questions we have about the origin of life when it comes to what were the first autocatalytic cycles like? How did evolution first occur? Were, were the original metabolites similar to the ones we have today? These are all open questions. We have theories about them, uh, but no solid answers. Uh, and so uh, my hope is that the, the ideas that I've introduced in this lecture uh, are helpful for beginning to think about how to solve them. So that concludes the lecture about autocatalysis and reaction networks. Uh, these are the, the references, the papers that were referred to in the slides, and also some additional uh, potential reading material. You can pause the video to go through them in detail. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and that's the end of the lecture.